All right, friends, it's time to uh, start our activities for the day. We're delighted to uh, welcome you here to the Eccles Conference Center. Uh, my name is Philip Barlow, and I'm the director of Religious Studies, uh, the Religious Studies program here at the university, and also along with Gary Anderson and Jack Welch, uh, part of the executive committee of the Academy for Temple Studies. And on behalf of the Academy and the university and the Religious Studies program, uh, we're very pleased that you join us this morning. We're excited about both the topic and the presenters who will be here, as well as to see you. Um, studying the divine feminine as it's been conceived. Oh, I'm sorry, are you raising a hand that you can't hear me? You can hear me, everyone was doing all right, thank you. Um, the divine feminine in most world religious traditions um, is a potent um, concept. Many gods are envisioned as having parallels or consorts. Um, we're here today to study particularly, particularly the divine feminine in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but we might, you might keep that in mind, uh, that the impulse is very strong and natural in many diverse world religions. Um, even when a specific feminine deity or feminine version of deity is not in the foreground um, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there's many instances, uh, even biblically, where God conceived as male, um, is given feminine images, as when Jesus says, uh, is reported as saying, uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in his lament at Jerusalem's um, corruption, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers its chicks. And um, there are many instances like that where we might think of what we um, traditionally conceive of as feminine traits um, to complement, parallel in some religious traditions, rival um, male conceptions of deity. We're here for diverse reasons. Um, many of you are from campus, many of you are from Cache Valley or elsewhere in Utah, and many of you are from wider venues around the United States. So you're here for diverse purposes. Uh, most of you are curious um, to explore this. Many of you have had thoughts of your own about the divine feminine in um, this, um, this, the largest religious tradition in the world, especially the Christian tradition, uh, the largest um, religious enterprise on the planet for a long time. Uh, so um, that will be the religious tradition of many of you here in the audience. Some of you are interested in this, uh, in the divine feminine as a symbolic thing to explore. Um, some of you are interested just to understand this neglected um, side of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Some of you are here for very personal religious reasons. Um, perhaps to explore an actual metaphysical reality in your own faith, or some of you I know from reading um, feminist literature or literature about women or by women, uh, some of you feel orphaned, um, like a, a sense of call towards a divine mother or a goddess. And, and orphaned about that not being fully explored in your own, um, your own faith or your own religious tradition. Uh, some of you are here, religion is often um, about right relations, trying to establish right relations in conceptions of deity or right relations among um, God and God's children. Um, there is also a certain LDS inflection. We're here 
um, in Utah, and one of my roles at the university is as the Leonard Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture. And so um, LDS scholars had a particular hand in forming the Academy for Temple Studies. Um, so this topic is too broad, too deep in the tradition to be um, restricted or owned by the Latter-day Saints, of course, but we should acknowledge that there's particular interest in those who um, started the academy, uh, that there's a kind of an LDS accent going on here without it being comprehensive, and the academy intends in the future to um, broaden its study of, of uh, things related to the temple. Not long ago, um, just a couple of months ago, Secretary of State John Kerry established a new office in the Department of State, um, and it has to do with religion and uh, religious and community initiatives, and his new office particularly focuses on religious diplomacy internationally. That's a terribly significant um, development. And in introducing Sean Casey, the director of this new office in the Department of State, um, Secretary Kerry said that if he were going to school um, afresh, going to school right now, he would very likely major in religion, major in religious studies, because he said, and he went on for a half hour about that, it is affecting, no matter what your private, secular, or religious beliefs, religion is so affecting everything about international relations and international diplomacy that he couldn't think of any field of study that would be more important for him to take on. Um, and it's often said that a person who only knows one language knows none. And I've often said, um, picking up on that thought, a person who only knows one religion knows none because the, the categories, the ways of thinking and behavior and value systems are so native to us that unless we can get outside that and study other traditions like we study other languages, we have less capacity for studying how this works and what assumptions and forces are at work. So um, you're going to hear some things that seem odd to you, that seem striking, that seem inspiring. You're here for religious and for academic and curiosity purposes. I urge you to, um, all of us, to be not just attuned to hearing something that we want to hear, but to welcome surprises and challenges and any diversities that um, we hear and work at today, uh, take that as a welcome thing, I hope, a challenge to think um, critically. We, along those lines, and in concluding before I introduce Gary Anderson to you, um, the Religious Studies Program is sponsoring um, a number of other programs, and if some of you are here from out of town and and have extra time, you might even want to join us for one that's happening beginning tomorrow. It's um, a symposium called Religion Unchained, and it's about black religious history in this country. At 4.30 in Old Main, 115, across the quad, um, Albert Rabato, Professor Albert Rabato from Princeton University will be our plenary speaker in the conference. Um, Professor Rabato did the landmark study on the religion of African American slaves in this um, country, a pivotal work in the history of American religious uh, history scholarship. Um, there's other Excellent scholars, but um, we're especially glad to have Professor Rabato. And then here in the Eccles Conference Center, this building in room 201 and 203, there's an all-day conference with five additional scholars talking on that subject. Um, then in late January or early February, we're still negotiating the date, we are bringing um, Sean Casey, who I mentioned a minute ago that Senator Kerry appointed to the new um, office about religious diplomacy. Sean Casey uh, will be coming to campus and we'll be having a symposium around that event on 
politics and religion and diplomacy, so you might look for that. Um, I will also finally um, make a pad of paper and leave it up here for breaks between our sessions and lunchtime and immediately after the conference if any of you would like to add your names. Many of you are already on this list, but if others of you would like to add your names to our email list so that you're apprised of such events as those I've just mentioned. So again, thanks for being here, and um, I'll turn time over to uh, Gary Anderson, who um, is central to the very formation of the Academy for Temple Studies, and he'll talk to us about some of the logistics of our day. Gary.